Hello everyone, this is Dr. Mercola and today I'm here with Dr. Stephanie Seneff who is an expert in sulfur and she has a very interesting history from, a, from her academic perspective and initially she was trained in an engineering frame even though her undergraduate degree was in biology and uh, she has now developed this incredible expertise in sulfur. But as we were talking, we learned that really one of her other passions is about statins. So I'd like her to describe specifically her academic credentials because I think that's important to put a frame on where your perspective is coming from. And then we'll discuss some information about the statins. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, so I am, uh, so I have a bachelor's degree from MIT uh, in biology with a um, minor in nutrition, food and nutrition. And my PhD is in electrical engineering and computer science, also from MIT. And I've been at MIT my entire life. OK. Are you and still there? I'm still there. OK. And um, now I'm a, se a senior research scientist, which is the equivalent of a full professor on the research staff. Okay. So I supervise PhD students, but luckily I don't have to teach. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so you're able to devote most of your time. So you literally research. have a full lifetime, academically, of going through the literature, reading it carefully. You understand the jargon, obviously and interpreting that. I mean, that's, that's your, your profession. Yes, and, I've, and uh, in biology, I've always been interested in biology, even though, actually even my work has been related to biology. My PhD was in a, an, aud an auditory model, a model for human auditory processing of speech. So that involved actually reading biology literature to understand how the brain processes speech. And then uh, I've continued in the area of speech, and uh, I have a couple hundred papers in the conference proceedings and in journal uh, research journals on the topic of spoken dialogue systems. So that's generally my area of expertise. And, and you've taken this expertise and you've actually applied it to data mining health information from patient-generated databases like VARs and ones that appear on WebMD that allow patients to self-report side effects from medications. That is exactly right. And I've actually become extremely excited recently about the wealth of information that's available on the web. Grassroots information provided by individual patients where they can describe their experience with a vaccine or with a drug, and they fill out a form. So it's extremely nice for us because we get things like the patient age, and we can use that to then compare data from a particular drug or a particular vaccine against age-matched data from some other drug or some other set of, va of vaccines or some other set of drugs. So by doing that, we can look at word frequencies uh, patterns in these two data sets and uncover really interesting side effects associated with various drugs. So we have applied that to the statin drugs with uh, great success and we have a couple of papers coming out in conferences. So these are new papers coming up, but if you, as you mentioned, you've published hundreds of papers yes. in peer-reviewed scientific literature, so right. you, you're an accepted uh, scientific researcher, there's no question. Right. And uh, I'm wondering if you can comment on some of these observations. So you continue to publish and one of your passions now is understanding statins and how they interact in, in impact on cholesterol. And because of your previous, uh, well, you had a personal issue with your husband, and then you obviously have a degree in biology, so there's there's some connections there. So you, you, you and you have the scientific training, so you put together these things, and, and along with your PhD work in, in data analysis, uh, and you've compiled some information about statin drugs. That's and right. I'm wondering if you can, and published, sought and wrote papers, yes. you know, obviously written, wrote, written hundreds of papers, you know how to write a paper. So you've submitted these to the credential scientific uh, journals, uh, documenting some of the f findings you found with statins. And I'm wondering if you can share what your experience was when you submitted these papers. Right, well I we wrote a paper on Alzheimer's. I was very interested in the connection between Alzheimer's and cholesterol, low cholesterol actually causing, being a source of Alzheimer's, and um, statins in particular because they lower cholesterol are going to make that problem worse. And we wrote a paper that had a, a lot of you know, references and a good story about the effect of low cholesterol in, um, in damaging the brain and inducing Alzheimer's. And in that paper we made several references to statin drugs. And we set, submitted it to a journal, and it came back rejected. And part of the grounds of rejection had to do with the, the mention of statins. And so we took out all the mentions of statins and resubmitted the paper to a different journal, and then it got accepted. And this paper is in, you can read this paper, in the uh, European Journal of Internal Medicine. And I can tell you that in the 10 years since statins were first introduced in 19, from 1980 to 1990, the um, incidence of heart failure doubled. And right now, heart failure has beat out cardiovascular disease as the number one cause of death in America. I mean, it's, it hasn't been... When did that transition occur? I don't know, but I've read that it's true today. Hmm. 
I mean, it's just kept on going up along with the increased use of statins. And it is very clear to me that statins are causing the heart failure. And I can give you all the reasons why. It's all, you know, different. Uh, of course, you know about coenzyme Q10, and that's part of it. Statins not only interfere with cholesterol synthesis, but they basically interfere with an early step in the mevalonate pathway. And that mevalonate pathway is the central pathway for all the sterols, uh, steroid, you know, management in the body. And steroids are really, really important. All the sterile products, cholesterol, mm -hmm. vitamin D, mm -hmm. vitamin D is actually very, very similar to cholesterol and mm -hmm. is produced from cholesterol in the skin. And then you have all the sex hormones, you know, estrogen and, and um, testosterone and mm -hmm. all of those. And then you have cortisone and you have um, the dolichols, which are involved in, uh, in keeping the membranes inside the cells healthy. And you have the coenzyme Q10, which is critical to the energy generation in the Krebs cycle in the cell. So all of these products of, of this pathway, the mevalonate pathway, are messed up by statins. So I don't personally understand why anyone would think that was something that would be worth taking. And here we are with tens of millions of people feeling convinced that they have to take their statin drug to keep their LDL under control. I always thought that there was one small subset of people who have the genetic condition familial hypercholesterolemia where they have cholesterol levels in excess of 330, 350 because of an, an, an Right, that's standard. true. Would that, would, do you think that there's an indication that they would benefit from statin? If I were one of them, I would not take a statin. Really? And I what's, what's your reasons for that? I just think that, that the drug is far too destructive. Okay. I cannot believe that something that interferes with something that important in biology could possibly be a okay. good idea, even that was in a, that case. That was my only exception, but it still is less than one in 1,000 people tiny, taking statins. Right, it's a very tiny piece of the population. Yeah. Um, I just feel the drug is so toxic that it can't even be good for them. Okay. Um, that's my personal opinion. Okay. You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from that understanding of the cholesterol sulfate is how you got into the broader picture of sulfur because it has yes. far additional implications other than heart disease, but perhaps you can continue to expand on the heart disease implication. Yeah, well, it was, I mean, it was really kind of, a, I had a few epiphanies along my research path because mm -hmm. here and there I would get a paper that would suddenly enlighten me and then it would take me down an entire new direction. And, um, and the cholesterol sulfate in the, the fact that the platelets, they were, um, they were clearly very happy, happy when they saw cholesterol sulfate and when they didn't, they were unhappy. So it was clear that they, the platelets needed cholesterol sulfate in the plaque to be happy. Um, and that's where I thought, and then I started looking in, I, got, I found a wonderful article by a guy named Strott uh, it was called Cholesterol Sulfate in Human Physiology, What's It All About? Question mark. Fascinating article. And cholesterol sulfate is a very overlooked molecule. It, there are not that many people doing research on it. Do, do, we, do we even assay for that, for that? There's not a blood test for it. it there is, but we don't do it. Okay. And, I, and I, would be, I think there are some easy experiments that could be done uh, mm -hmm. comparing, uh, measuring people's cholesterol sulfate level uh, with reference to how much sunlight exposure they get. And mm. this is where I got into another idea. I was sort of trying to figure out where mm -hmm. does cholesterol sulfate come from otherwise. Because the, the statin a attitude is, okay, you've got high LDL. High LDL is correlated with heart disease. We've got a drug that can knock that LDL down and then voila, you're going to be happy. My attitude is you've got high LDL. That LDL is needed for something. What it's needed for is to produce cholesterol sulfate to supply the heart and probably also the brain, by the way because you get blocked arteries feeding the brain as well. How can you produce that cholesterol sulfate some other way in order that the cardiovascular disease does not have to be there? That's my thinking. What is the way that cholesterol sulfate is normally produced? And when you read something like Strott's article, you find out that the skin produces huge amounts of cholesterol sulfate. And it's, it's very uh, high concentration in a healthy skin uh, in the epidermis and in the outer layer. And that cholesterol sulfate in the skin is very important for keeping microbes out and for keeping water in, among many other things. But it basically provides a healthy barrier to the world in the skin. Does some of it get transferred into the blood? Exactly. So okay. the, this article by Strott said we're not sure where it comes from in the blood, but part of, uh, probably the skin provides a large part of what's in the blood. And vitamin D is produced in the skin and it's sulfated. This is something very few people realize. The vitamin D that you produce in your skin goes into your blood as vitamin D sulfate. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's very, very important. And when you take a vitamin D pill, it's not sulfated. Yeah, because for the longest time, and, and, you know, and, and to this day, I'm cons my consistent recommendations on the importance of vitamin D is to first get it from the sun, 
That's the number one recommendation. Obviously, a large people, percentage of the population cannot do that in the winter, mm. at least in North America. So then my second recommendation is to use a safe tanning bed, which more closely approximates the sun. And if that's still not an option, then to swallow the vitamin D orally, but that is the last choice. Absolutely. Which and is in probably fact, better than not taking any, but, but still not as good as the sun. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, but I didn't, under, just from a, a theoretical perspective, it made sense, but I didn't understand the yeah. science behind it. But this sounds to be one of the first good explanations as to why that is true. And it turns out there is a food that contains vitamin D sulfate, naturally. And that food is raw milk. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Very interesting. And, and of well, course, our I, government raw is milk trying products. very hard. Would it be raw milk products too? Like I think so. I mean, okay. so I don't know if, if processing, you know, like what the happens butter with, or the yeah. yogurt or kefir. I, you know, I don't know for sure, but okay. I know raw milk contains vitamin D sulfate. And I think it's absolutely uh, essential for the baby. Mm -hmm. and, and this is also something extremely interesting. Now, we'll, I'm going to get off on a little tangent here with mm -hmm. the sulfate, because this is something only discovered recently, and I was really thrilled to discover this. The, when the, um, a woman has a, about uh, 1.5, there's a unit, I don't know what the unit is, but 1.5 units of cholesterol sulfate normally in her blood. When she gets pregnant, this number starts going up. And throughout the pregnancy, it rises in her blood. But more than that, Cholesterol sulfate accumulates in the villi, in the placenta, that sort of hook up with the baby's blood supply. So this is where the nutrients are transferred mm -hmm. from the placenta to the baby. And the cholesterol sulfate rises tremendously in the placenta, in those villi, over the course of the pregnancy, going to levels like 24. So 1.5, mm -hmm. 24. There's hugely more cholesterol sulfate in those villi towards the end of the pregnancy. And then when the baby's born, colostrum contains a lot of sulfur even more than milk, and then mother's milk contains sulfur as well. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a very strong attempt to get sulfur to the baby right around the time it's born. But more than that, cholesterol. And the thing that is really special about cholesterol sulfate is that it can travel in the blood uh, freely in the blood. It's water soluble. It's actually soluble in both water and fat. Cholesterol has to be packaged up inside LDL in order to be transported. And so when you don't have but enough... But the sulfate attachment makes it water-soluble. Sul sulfate is what makes it water-soluble. And that is true for all the sterols, or at least many of them. I've certainly found it to be true for estrogen, um, for vitamin D. So all of these things, and even things like resveratrol goes into the blood sulfated. Yeah, so I didn't realize that the vitamin D was sulfated. Uh, of course, the vitamin D that is formed in the skin gets transported into... It's not really the active form. It gets converted by the liver and the kidney. Yes, right, but, right. there but is all that. It, but, but is the sulfur still con contained in the active form? Well, it's interesting with sulfate, because sulfate actually inactivates vitamin D. The, the sulfated form of vitamin D is, does not work for calcium transport, which mm. I find very, very intriguing. And in fact, I think it's the sulfated form for vitamin D that offers the protection from cancer, it strengthens your immune system, it protects you from cardiovascular disease. You know how they say vitamin mm -hmm. D, it does oh, all sure, these things. Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, we've been and it's good for your that. brain, helps depression. I think all of those effects of vitamin D are effects of vitamin D sulfate. And your suspicion is that s the simple oral non-sulfated form will not provide the same benefits. And cannot get there. I mean, I read that it cannot be converted to vitamin D sulfate. I was stunned to read that. Hmm, that and I read just, it. That is an amazing point. Yeah. So you have to get the sulfated form in the skin. And then the other thing that's really interesting with the baby is that um, a mother who has high cholesterol, high serum cholesterol, so would you guess that her baby would have high serum cholesterol or low serum cholesterol when it's born? This is, of course, a loaded question. I would suspect it would be high. It's low. Oh, it's low. So now can you figure out why? It's using it for synthesis of important It can't components? get through. Oh. It can't get through. And the mother has high serum cholesterol, I think, because she has low serum cholesterol sulfate. I think the two go together. Okay. So in order to, so the way to bring down your LDL in a healthy way mm -hmm. is to get sunlight exposure in the skin. You will produce, your skin, your skin will produce cholesterol sulfate, which will then flow freely through the blood, uh, not packaged up inside LDL. And therefore, the liver doesn't have to make so much LDL. Mm -hmm. So the LDL goes down. And in fact, uh, places that are sunny have uh, significantly, there's a complete inver you know, inverse relationship between, well, I guess direct relationship, inverse relationship between sunlight and cardiovascular disease. The more sunlight, the less cardiovascular disease. And I read a lovely article, it's pretty much just linear, you're looking at places and their amount of sun and latitude, 
versus cardiovascular disease. It's a straight line. Yeah, and the key assumption there, however, is that people are going out in the sun because it's certainly possible to live in tropical environments and stay inside all the time or go outside completely cut with your skin cover. That's right. So and you don't get the benefits. Yeah. It's not just living in the environment. You have to be exposed to the, sun, the, sun, the sun, sunlight on your exposed skin. That's right. Um, so, uh, so, then, so this thing with the baby then is that the mother who has high cholesterol has low cholesterol sulfate. The cholesterol sulfate can't deliver the, the sul cholesterol. Both the cholesterol and the sulfur can't get delivered to the baby. And therefore, the baby's born with low cholesterol. The baby's also born with fatty deposits in its arteries already, fatty deposits. Mm -hmm. So this is, you know, the fatty deposits are supposed to be associated with high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. But this is low cholesterol plus fatty deposits. And they're there, I think, to start this cholesterol sulfate program that's replacing the one that isn't happening because there's an anticipation that this kid has a problem and has the same problem that adults have when they get cardiovascular disease. But it's normal physiological because that's the way healthy children are born. Children who have adequate cholesterol sulfate delivered from their mother do not have the fatty deposits. Oh, fatty okay. Deposits. I'm sorry. sorry. It's I missed a consequence message. of the low cholesterol. Okay. So it's association of low cholesterol with fatty deposits rather than high cholesterol. It's bizarre. But the high cholesterol that's associated with fatty deposits in the adult that's causing heart disease is a solution, not a cause. It's a solution. It's a complete turnaround. It's a complete turnaround. And the worst thing you can do is to, to clobber the LDL for the heart disease because it's, you're going to end up with heart failure. Which is just for reinforcing the, the, a common fact that I think a number of our viewers may not be aware of, but one in four Americans over the age of 45 are currently on this drug therapy, statin. That statins. is incredible. One in four, 25%. That is so shocking. And I have to say, I know personally, they're prescribing it to young newlywed women in their 20s who are about to start a family, and they're not letting them even know. The doctor doesn't even tell them that this is class X for pregnancy, like thalidomide. I did not know it was class X. Yeah, well, see, you don't even know it. I mean, it's, it's shocking to me. It's and class the, X. Yes, it, it destroys the nervous system. The only other class X I know is, knew was uh, Accutane. Thalidomide. Remember Thalidomide? Or Accutane, too. Yeah, well, thalidomide was horrible. Oh, I was sure. a child that, when I that was started actually one seeing of the, those pictures. One of the good things the FDA did. It, it was a world leader. I was leader. so proud of my country, and it pains me when I think today where we've come, because I remember, I was 10 years old. I was a girl, right? And there was a woman who mm -hmm. headed the FDA, and I saw this article in, like, Newsweek or something, and there were these babies without arms, without legs, uh, without ears, you know. And, and this big article, and, there was, and it was heroic. This woman who headed the FDA kept the drug out of our country, and I just stood tall as an American and as a female. I was so proud. It's probably one of the last good things the FDA I, did. I'm so, you know, frustrated today to, at where we've come in this whole thing, and it's just amazing, you know? So, yes. So it was started with good intentions, as many federal agencies are, but yes. they tend to deteriorate over time as they had this merger of corporate influences that, that really... Uh, misdirect their initial intentions. Well, it's gotten to the point where the FDA is basically, as I see it, owned by the, by the drug companies mm -hmm. because they get their funding, from, you know, a lot of their funding they get from the drug companies. So it's their, in their interest to please the person who, who gives them money, you know? Sure. It's extremely an extremely broken system right now, I feel. That's resulted in one in four Americans now on, on statins. actively it's, being encouraged by the media, by almost oh, every health amazing. expert out there. I mean, I have friends who, and I, they have a whole bunch of problems with their health, and every one of those problems I happen to know is a side effect of statin treatment, because I've read so much about statins, and I've even studied, actually, statins, and I can get, to, I have papers that I'm going to be presenting at conferences, two papers, on, this is actually wonderful, because it's blending my, my, my real work which is building spoken dialogue systems with this sidekick thing, which is going to become my full-time job in the future. I'm working towards that goal. But um, so the beginning thing is to build these systems, which are spoken dialogue systems that provide access to information on the web. And so what I did was I got a whole bunch of uh, statin re drug reviews by uh, patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can grab these from the web. They're on places like WebMD, I mean, all these sites that have uh, drug reviews of side effects of experiences with all the different drugs. So these are reports that patients have and they just compile them? It's very much grassroots patient, patient provided I mean, reports. WebMD facilitates that? That's surprising. Yeah, there's uh, patients like Because they're really sponsored by the drug companies. I know. Well, they, they, they provide an opportunity for people to just fill out their experience with the drug and sometimes mm -hmm. they'll say it worked you know, great and I'm very happy. Um, but, um, and so every drug has all these reports. 
and you can just grab them from the web and you can process them using natural language techniques hmm. and uh, what and you can use a there's a straightforward mathematical formula you can use to figure out uh, by looking at word frequencies you know if a certain word shows up a hundred times when people are talking about this drug and only two times when they're talking about that drug then you can guess that this drug probably causes that side effect mm -hmm. and you can actually have a specific measure of the likelihood that this distribution this, would have occurred Is this something chance. you figured out or something you learned That's from That's standard technology. I mean, I know it because it's standard stuff wow. in my field, but I'm just applying it to a very new domain. I, no one else is, uh, that I'm aware of has actually applied it to this domain. That's an and interesting, it's, that's a very interesting innovation. It's very, very useful and, yeah. and it's terrifying actually what you find out about statin drugs by doing this. And my, my papers talk about it, but what have you learned? Um, yeah. Can you well, share so that with us now? Muscle or? pain and weakness, which are known okay. side effects, huge. You know, 0 0.00000 several zeros likelihood of this distribution being occurring by chance. And what we did was we took uh, all the statin, pile of statin reviews, like 8,000 of them. And then we sampled 8,000 other reviews distributed in the same age. It was nice because the reviews all tell you how old the mm -hmm. person is. So you can sample from this large, you know, 100,000 reviews of all different drugs and sample a population that has the same age distribution as you're seeing in the statin drugs, because you wouldn't want to be comparing children sure. with old people. And then you can just look at the nut words and see which ones come out much more commonly on the statin side. And, uh, and so uh, muscle pain and weakness are hugely more common on the statin side. But also um, things like ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's disease, neuropathy, um, diabetes, arthritis, um, of course, cognitive problems, um, all of these things are statistically significantly more likely, uh, and in many cases strongly statistically significantly more likely, with the statin drugs than with this collection of all these other drugs. So these, I think, are all side effects of statins. Um, it's very, very disturbing in my view. And of course, ALS, I mean, is also, um, other people have written about statins causing ALS. I'm not the only person who's, in fact, all of these things, there's articles about diabetes in statins, you can find these in the obscure literature, of course, because well, the, the diabetes connection is actually relatively recent c observation. And, and yeah, there's a couple of recent papers that I'm aware of that yeah. talk specifically about Just statins causing diabetes. It really diabetes. wasn't a known. Uh, rel uh, yeah, well, I, I, I mean, of. Alzheimer's, of course, is a very interesting yeah. story with statins, and one of the things I find is that the, I think the industry intentionally tries to promote the concept that their drug protects from something, when they, I'm guessing, think it does the opposite. So they want to prime you to, to be happy, to think first of all that it protects, and then finally you find out, oh well, it doesn't actually protect after all, rather than thinking maybe it actually causes it, you know? Mm -hmm. And Alzheimer's is very interesting, because early on they pushed hard, and the Newsweek had a little article saying, sure, how, for promotion. isn't this great, even in, on, in addition to lowering your cholesterol, you will also protect yourself from Alzheimer's. And recently, now there's just recently come out a placebo-controlled study and they and I'm sure they tried hard to to get the drug to behave itself in Alzheimer's and they found that the, the, the treatment group had worse outcome than the non-treatment group you know increased uh, accelerated uh, mental decline in the people who were taking the statins you know well so, some of, just a question I had on some of the statins uh, the studies suggest that for people with heart disease that there may be another benefit from statins, this anti-inflammatory, yes. anti-thrombotic component, which may actually be beneficial, not, the, not, not related to the only question. I'm wondering what your, your comments or views are on that are. Yes, I've read several articles along those lines, and that's kind of become, I think, almost accepted even by some of the mainstream mm -hmm. researchers, that it's the anti-inflammatory effect that is offering the protection that mm -hmm. you observe in sort of, because it, for the men in their 50s, carefully controlled designs they can show and they have numbers like 30% mm -hmm. you know which sounds really good 30% decrease in the uh, incidence of heart attacks now this is men in their 50s and men in the 50s don't have many heart, heart attacks so in terms of the absolute numbers it's actually very very small right that's a that's a, a major uh, sort of play on words that they yes. do the difference between absolute and, and relative and relative risk reduction what they just which makes it appear far yes. greater impact than it really is. Absolutely the case. And in fact, it would take 60 men in their 50s to take a statin drug for four or five years in order for one of those 60 men to, to, to get rid of one heart attack. And it might even be a very small heart attack that doesn't really matter. And everybody else would have no, no benefit. 
and all of those people would suffer from all the side effects that statins cause. I think statins basically make you grow older faster. I mean, that's the way I would eat most easily characterize them. And it's interesting, some of the side effects that we found, you know, losing your hair, mm -hmm. and of course, mental decline, frailty. I mean, frailty is just huge. Statins really uh, make your muscles weak. You can't open the pickle jar anymore, you know, and um, these are all sort of, and arthritis, mm -hmm. diabetes, these are all things that are associated with getting older, you mm -hmm. know? Alzheimer's. And, and Alzheimer's, of course, and, um, and Parkinson's and ALS. I mean, all of these things is basically, uh, statins make you grow older faster. And then you end up with heart failure. I mean, they, they cause heart failure is, is also statistically mm -hmm. significant, and then liver disease and kidney failure, all do these you, things. Do you think that the risk for heart failure overall uh, is, increases the total death rate from people with heart, to, even with people without heart disease? Uh, it compensates for the benefit they get from the anti-inflammatory, antithrombotic benefit. Yeah, let me go back to the anti-inflammatory. I didn't quite understand this question. Maybe well, there's a certain benefit from anti-inflammatory and in, in, in decreasing the blood viscosity. Does that is that overwhelmed by the risk for heart disease that for that is, results from taking these statins? The heart failure. Yeah. See, heart failure is heart a different is, is a system. different syndrome yeah. altogether, and that's right. what and that's so, why I think they keep talking about car cardiovascular disease. So they're careful well, to use the term. Right. When they when when you typically hear about the term cardiovascular disease, that excludes heart excludes failure. It's heart a total failure. different disease category. Yes. Which is very convenient for them because then people aren't really realizing. So that it's the another are way this. to confuse people and mislead absolutely, them. Absolutely, absolutely. When, when actually, in the total perspective, it really should be classified as part of heart disease because it's affecting. I the know. Heart. It annoys me that they get by with that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the statins, it's I'll tell you how they cause, and they also cause all this calcium buildup. You get these calcified, you know, uh, valves and things like that, and you get um, the um, calcium is very, very important for the uh, for signaling in muscles. And of mm -hmm. course, the heart is a muscle. I mean, you figure if, the, if statins wreck the muscles, which they do, the skeletal muscles, they absolutely wreck them. The heart is a muscle, too. And the only reason the heart is, res is, is not wrecked as badly is because the skeletal muscles are tasked with uh, helping out the heart. And, and, and it's interesting what happens with statins. The, um, and again, so let me try to, this is actually an interesting story. And it's another um, essay that I wrote on the web, I think even after I wrote the sulfur one. Um, the statin drugs uh, interfere with the liver's ability to make cholesterol. That's, you know, obviously they do that. The liver needs to make cholesterol in order to store fat. And it needs to store fat in order to process fructose. And mm -hmm. fructose, of course, high fructose diet is a huge problem. The liver can't process fructose anymore because it can't store it as fat with the statin, because it can't make the cholesterol. Now somebody else has to take care of the fructose because fructose is really bad. It's, it's much more glycating. glycating I didn't realize damage. there was another alternative for detoxifying fructose other than the liver. Yeah, well, so there is, and it's the muscle cells that will rescue the body. And what they do is they go into anaerobic metabolism because you cannot handle fructose in the context of aerobic metabolism. You're going to get glycation damage. You're going to get oxidation damage. It's going to be a mess. So the muscle cells go into an anaerobic mode where there's no oxygen, and they take in the fructose ferociously, and they skim off a tiny bit of energy from it, just enough to kind of keep mm -hmm. going, and then they produce lactate. So they basically convert the fructose into lactate, and the lactate fuels the heart and the liver. So the skeletal muscle cells make a heroic sacrifice in statin drug therapy um, in order to rescue the heart and the liver. And then the heart and liver are able to use the lacto lactate for fuel, and therefore they can stay healthy. And so, but the muscles get completely wrecked, and then you end up with, um, you know, in a wheelchair or something like that. So it's really scary, uh, I think, uh, that particular aspect of, of the statin drugs. Is that different from the, the rhabdomyolysis or the bursting? Of yeah, the, the rhabdomyolysis is because the muscles got wrecked and the, okay. the uh, hemoglobin, the myoglobin in the muscles precipitates out and gets, uh, and gets, the muscle falls apart and then the myoglobin gets into the blood and then the, the kidney has to dispose of the myoglobin because it has to get rid of all these things in the blood that you don't want there because they're going to make, make a mess mm -hmm. of things. And the kidney gets destroyed by the myoglobin that gums up the kidney, uh, you know. Because mm -hmm. uh, it has to filter it out. Has to filter it out, and then that kills the kidney. Yeah, rhabdomyolysis is the very severe outcome of, of the muscle damage that happens in rare cases in statins. But in virtually everyone, you had this muscle, continuous co uh, muscle damage occurring as a result of the trying to detoxify the, the statins. Yeah, so going back to this thing about statins and anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. um, I think it's true that they're anti inflammatory Well, it's actually complicated because I've actually read articles that say both ways and depending upon the concentration and all this mm -hmm. stuff. So it's, 
what they do is they mess up the cell's ability to signal to others, to communicate with other cells. And there's a whole communication process that goes on in the plaque orchestrating this activity of producing the cholesterol sulfate. And you need to oxidize uh, the LDL in order for it to be taken up by the, by the macrophages. So that's the, you need these oxidizing agents to do that um, when you don't have enough cholesterol sulfate. And the statins interfere with that, um, so you can't. So the cells basically are crippled, and they can't do their job which is to produce the cholesterol sulfate. And they couldn't anyway because the LDL is also clobbered. So that it's a perfect storm to decrease the bioavailability of cholesterol sulfate to the heart, which then means that the heart is deficient in cholesterol and deficient in sulfur. And those are two very bad deficiencies because, uh, and of course there's also the coenzyme Q10, which mm -hmm. is critical for the energy generation. When the cell wall of the muscles in the heart are deficient in cholesterol, then the, the, the cell starts leaking potassium because the cholesterol keeps this, just like the cholesterol keeps the skin uh, ba barrier healthy, it also keeps the cell barrier healthy. And it, it keeps the, the ions sulf in. The cholesterol sulfate? Yeah, well, cholesterol, actually. But okay. cholesterol sulfate delivers cholesterol. Actually, cholesterol sulfate can go into membranes 10 times as well as cholesterol. So not only is it good at moving around in the blood, mm -hmm. it's also good at entering the membranes. And I think the sulfate, and I'll get to the sulfate in a moment because that's also very interesting, but it gets thrown outside to create a negative charge around the cell, which is incredibly important for the cell's health. So um, the cholesterol in the cell membrane uh, keeps the potassium from leaking. And, and this is talked about very extensively in... Um, and another article that I read that was very, very interesting, and this was um, all about cholesterol and membranes and leaks, ion leaks. And uh, without adequate cholesterol, the potassium leaks out, and the cell has to consume a lot of energy to keep that potassium in against that gradient. So it's constantly pumping the potassium back in again. And what it can decide to do instead is let the potassium go, let some of it go, and bring in calcium instead. Because calcium's a bigger molecule and it won't leak out. And I think that's what's going on with all this calcification. And what happens is all your artery walls get calcified and your heart valves get calcified. And meanwhile, your, your bones get leached of calcium and you end up with osteoporosis. Because mm -hmm. the calcium is being stolen from the bones in order to provide it to all these cells that are deficient in cholesterol in their membranes and therefore have to replace potassium with calcium. Because you need to have the ions in order for the cell to be, uh, to be functioning at all. Mm -hmm. So there's a replacement going on. And then once the calcium is inside the cell cytoplasm, there's much less of a calcium gradient between the cytoplasm and these internal uh, cel cellules that are, you have to get the calcium um, transport across the internal membranes in order to trigger contraction. So the muscle cell in the heart becomes less able to contract as a consequence of having too much calcium in the mm -hmm. cytoplasm. And then, um, and so then, and then you have the less energy generation because of the coenzyme Q10 depletion. So several ways in which, uh, and then also you have a, a greater, an increased risk of infection in the heart. And that's because of the lack of the sulfate. The sulfate is, ke keeps the negative charge around the outside of the cell, and the negative charge keeps the bacteria out. And this would be an infection from uh, an organism floating in the blood? Yeah, all these uh, back, the back microbes that are getting through the skin because of the lack of cholesterol sulfate there. So they get into the skin, they also get into the gut, and they get into the lungs more easily because of the lack of cholesterol sulfate. Then they get into the blood, and then again, because of the lack of sulfate, they get into the individual um, cells that are lining the, uh, the, cell, uh, the, the artery wall and even penetrating into the heart muscle. And that gives you things like myocarditis, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, heart infection, infection of or the heart. actually inflammation, but most likely in, in, in inflammation from the infection. Yeah, so it's pretty much a bad scene. Mm -hmm. The reason I, I, I wanted to mention this to our viewers is that it's a very classic example of what's wrong with the entire system. Uh, there's this merger of industry into the, the scientific professionals. I mean, they they're literally are generating tens of billions of dollars of profits. It's an enormous amount of power to do this that it creates from this profit. So as a result, they've invested significant portions of that into marketing. And one of the most effective forms of marketing is to control the educational processes that essentially uh, educate the professionals. Because the professionals uh, speak to the media and, and of course are represent, you know, basically talk to their patients. So if you can control the input of data that's fed to them through the editorial review boards of these scientific journals, 
then you really control the whole system. Absolutely. I think that's exactly what's going on. And I think that, uh, I think many people are aware of that, that they cannot get their paper published in, in one of the high-end journals if it mentions something negative about statins. I think it's extremely difficult to get such, such things printed, accepted by these journals because of the influence of the statin industry on the journal. I think that's a very serious problem. Yeah, and we have one in four Americans over the age of 45 now taking these drugs. It's and shocking. there's a there's a and it's increasing. It is not decreasing. Yes. It's increasing. Right. Right, and it as it disturbs me greatly that they're now prescribing statins to women in their reproductive years and not and the doctor doesn't even bother to tell the woman that statins are class X for pregnancy just like thalidomide and they cause severe damage to the neural tube in the in the embryo likely leading to a, a miscarriage. And if you're lucky, I mean, because otherwise you'll have an extremely disabled child. And, I, you know, I don't understand why they're not making this clear to women. <laughs> you, I believe you probably understand. It's just that it's such a violent objection to the ethics involved. Because they know this. This is not a mystery. Yet they're, they're willing to sacrifice human life. It's amazing, though. For it really profit. Mm -hmm. It, it's really a sad commentary on the evolution that has occurred in this, this corporate level of influence. Um, but it seems to be the, the, the reality that we're contending with nowadays. I so, agree. 